Hey everybody, um, my name is Don Duncan. I'm a lecturer in broadcast practice at Queen's University in Belfast. And today I'm going to talk about um, some practices research that I've done in um, documentary and media. Um, and the focus is really looking at the um, power that audio has in um, excavating and reconstructing experiences, past experiences in my case, um, that were erased or lost or hidden or oppressed or repressed. Um, and I, a lot of what I'm going to talk about really applies to um, any kind of community or people that are have experience of oppression or marginalization or, or erasure. Um, but in my case, I'm gay and um, it was a biographical piece, so it applies to LGBT pasts. Um, so I'm going to look at, in this session, this brief session, the problem of silence. When you're talking about people's experiences that have been oppressed or, or erased, there's a lack, a lack of documentary uh, footage, of documentary material that you can use as primary sources. So there's a certain silence you have to encounter and deal with. Um, and then I'm going to look specifically at ways audios can address that problem of silence. And so how silence can be mobilized, you know, if you're thinking about it in the right way, to, to, it can be mobilized to be narrative um, or to be vocal, have a voice of some vocal quality. Um, and similarly, how, how, how um, silence or how silence can be used to activate um, ambient sound, but also how ambient sound or nonverbal communication can be um, can be vocalized, can be given a vocal quality. And then finally, I'm going to look at a little bit more explicit, I suppose, um, tools for storytelling um, in this context. And this would be um, tools involving reconstruction and or um, reenactments. Um, and then I'm going to we're going to listen to a seven minute extract from the practices research piece that I made, which is called a piece that's called All That I Saw it Melts Into Air, made it in 2019. It's an experimental, I would describe it as an experimental hybrid documentary. And um, that happens, my interest was to do a documentary live on stage and involve a lot of the techniques I use as a documentarian and a journalist um, uh, live in, in the live context, it was pre-produced sound mixes or sound, you know, clips of sound that I had uh, queued up and I could play them out live on stage as I was performing. But it was a combination of live spoken word, gestural theater, pre-produced sounds, these clips I talked about, and then props that had a sort of symbolic or meaningful, um, meaningful uh, signification. Um, so it was produced in 2019, performed in English, language at the Hearsay Audio Festival in um, in Limerick in Ireland and then a second performance in the Irish language at, um, at the Lulunasa Festival in Belfast and that was in August 2019. In Irish it's called Jainter Navni Den Buini, you see that in the poster here on the right. The whole performance lasted an hour and ten minutes um, but again I'm going to just play as, as an excerpt of seven minutes a scene um, and what I'm playing at today is an audio recording of the performance. So you're not going to get the entire information, but in, for the purposes of this of this um, presentation, I think it's actually quite helpful to be limited to the audio, so you can focus in on what the audio is doing in the performance. So here are just some photographs of the performance. You can see the stage is quite. I didn't really spend that much time on set dressing or staging, stage dressing. It was really pared down, and it's very much about a very audio focused. Um, um, so there you go. So I'm going to start off with the power problem of silence. So when you have um, a situation where there is a lack of um, do primary source documentary material, um, and I'm quite drawn by uh, Claude Lanzmann, what he said about his project in Shoah, the documentary about the uh, Holocaust. And he, told, he said that his issue there was he was dealing with the, dis the destruction of the destruction. So, of course, the Holocaust was talking about the destruction of um of of Claude Landsman's people of the Jewish people um and in his terms of his documentary project the the, the the what you would normally have as primary evidence so uh documentary evidence had been destroyed by the Nazis as they left so or as as, as they were being um overpowered so um he was dealing with a silence that i think you know while obviously the holocaust and what's 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 covered in shoah what's represented in shoah is not comparable to what i'm doing and all that i saw that melts into air in terms of the you know the degree and the scale of the destruction there are similar problems um when, from the point of view of a, of a documentarian 
and there's this silence that, that you're facing if you're trying to tell a story from a past that's been destroyed or erased or marginalized, how do you navigate or circum circumnavigate that silence? Um, what do you do about the lack of primary source material, the lack of archival material, the lack of contempor contemporary representations, which was the case for me as a, as a gay child in the Irish Midlands, there was no media representation around at all. So how am I gonna then go back and tell a story about that? So the question comes up is like, how silent is silence? And in sound studies, you know, the consensus is that silence as we think of it, isn't really silent at all. That there are audio signals there and there is, there is sonic information. And that really, unless you're in an, in an, anecho an anechoic um, chamber, you're not really getting real, you're not getting silence at all. That silence is really theoretical. So with that in mind, there are strategies to use silence and non-verbal or ambient sound as a mechanism by which to create expression and representation. So what I would say is looking at this, these efforts to sort of excavate the past, instead of focusing on that sort of a, a, um, a verbocentric approach, and not to say that word, spoken word isn't part of it, because it was part of my process, but I really focused in on the nonverbal as a way to approach and represent the emotional and subjective truth of that past. Um, Edward Said talks about silence. He says it's, silence is really, really important um, for understanding the experience of the oppressed. Um, and he's, of course, talking about it from a, a kind of an orientalist and uh, post-colonial perspective. But he says that you know, those that have an oppressed and denied vocal agency can shatter the oppressor's wall-to-wall -wall description, leaving new space to be filled by people speaking for themselves. So that's what I'm trying to do in All That Are Solid and Melts Into Their Air. It's one of the main questions driving it is um, how do I speak for myself? And how do I retroactively create that narrative and resurrect that truth? So silence is a vocal too. I'm gonna to look at a little bit of theory here and then we'll go ahead and listen to it. Silence can acquire sig signification, Renoff says, in contexts where there is verbal and nonverbal sonic information. So by contrast to the explicit information that's coming through the verbal and nonverbal, silence in that context can gain meaning. Um, and I think it's quite interesting, Sanders, they, they frequently talk about the sonic nature of silence, like I've just mentioned earlier, and its capacity for meaning, me, meaning making. And Street says, Sean Street says that the invisible can, can become visible through narratively engaging with silence. So these are very powerful notions for people that are trying to tell stories, you know, trying to conjure voices from the silence. The notion that silence can render the invisible visible is, is quite interesting. Um, and silence can be used as a mechanism then be, beyond just silence itself, but to trigger meaning making in the audience or the listener. So Street says that our cultural conditioning to view silence as an entity in a state of lacking triggers our imaginations to create sound out of silence. So we need to fill that void. And so when there's silence there, if, if uh, we have a tendency then to project or to imagine or to make connections. So it's a very um, provocative, um, narrative material silence. Strachan and Leonard um, say also similarly that silence helps foreground ambient sound and enable its, inactiva its activation as an experiential trigger. So you can use silence as a kind of lever to either highlight ambient nonverbal or ambient sound or give it a sort of a, 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 a prevalence that will then uh, possibly lead to audience interpretation of it and activation, narrative activation of it. So activating ambient sound. I'm just getting a little bit deeper into this. I drew a lot on sound design and on acoustic ecology, um, the, the fields of acoustic ecology and sound design when it came to the work I was doing, because they provide ample means by which to activate uh, ambient sound. Watson, Chris Watson, the famous sound designer, talks about geophony. Um, and I'm gonna just notice there is a little typo there. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, he talks about geophony and uh, geophony is, 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 is the sound of our natural environments that can gain a personified um, dimension. So water, wind, uh, that he's famous for his sound of, of earth moving or glaciers moving, that they can gain through sound design, a personification that um, we as listeners project onto it. So that's very, very useful for the kind of thing I was doing. And then Toop talks about biotic voices and similar dynamic, but he's looking at giving sort of living entities, animals and plants, especially a personification and a real like a, a, a characterized um, presence in a sound mix. 
So these are these are the ways that you can start bringing soundscapes and bringing past moments alive and infusing them with meaning for the audience. Um, so you can use silence and ambient sound to move the listener and the audience into imaginative worlds through evocation. So I use verbal exp explication. I'm on stage talking about a situation and I'm, I'm, I'm contextualizing the sound that's about to be heard. And that, um, that really helps activate these, uh, the silence and the, um, the uh, ambient sound. Um, but also within the sound mixes I produce, um, I, I co-position sounds and through that co-positioning you can create meaning and suggestions and evocation that transports, that can transport the um, audience into um, a situation that you wanna, you want them to think about. And then audio mixing techniques, how high or low certain sounds are, are in a mix or what prevalence they're given, I used a lot during the whole piece um, to suggest, a lot of it was suggestion, it wasn't that explicit, to suggest connections or to suggest moods. And that really helped me return into this sort of subjective truth, my own subjective truth of the past, um, um, as I was evacu evacuating and um, excavating these moments in the past. And then another aspect that's useful here is the intimacy, the famous intimacy of audio um, and the synaptic relationship as Truo calls it between the audience and the material. So I've kind of hit on this before where in sound, much like I think like reading actually, it, it, it's, it's triggering the imagination. We're having to fill in gaps quite often they're visual gaps and they say, you know, sound is the most visual medium of all because we're having to create those images in our heads. And there's this very intimate synaptic relationship between the audience and the material that I think can lead to very interesting moments of criticality later, which I will actually get onto in a bit. Um, Chuo says that there's a completion of the networks of, of, of meaning that's in the material that is only possible when the audience engages with it. So now I'm going to go to the last aspect is reconstructions and reenactments, which when I'm talking about silence and, and ambient sound, it's very suggestive and evocative and it's, it's not always very um, explicit. Reconstructions and reenactments can be very explicit, explicit because the verbal voice is in there. Um, and, you know, they, yeah, they get, but they can also be problematic for ethical reasons as well. Um, so there, these are other tools to create voice and representation from silence, right? So I can return to a place in time in the past and recreate that from my memory um, and other, from my memory and other people's memories by doing sort of interviews and things like that. But um, uh, it's, a, it, 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 they're a way for us, to, as Rabin, Rabinowitz says, to probe the interface between history and personal experience. And I think this is a really interesting place to get to when we're talking about these erased path, paths um, they, they don't exist in these so-called sort of objective um, public records. So that lack, that, that absence gives us a certain license, I think, to, um, and, and there's a certain currency then that comes with the subjective realities that, that, that we have to then trade in when we're returning to these times. So um, reconstruction and reenactments probe the interface between history and personal experience. And that's a really interesting place to then get into a space of revisionism or revisiting or analyzing or critically thinking about the past. And this is where the split figure is. So the split figure is from Margulies. Um, and it's the figure that you can create in reenactment where you can see in the photograph there, I'm on stage recreating a moment in time. This particular scene I'm talking about being an older boy pulling a bell in a belfry in the, in the church back home in, in Longford in Ireland. And, but I'm also there, so I'm, I'm, I'm two things at once. I am in the present day in that, that's in Belfast, in that um, public space, but I'm also a figure that's in this past reconstructed world. And so there is a um, dialectical distance there that's created. Uh, the split figure can inhabit the past, the present, or both at the same time, which I did fluidly. Um, and so this figure facilitates, Rabinowitz says, the revision of the past and this, not, this notion of historical justice, that you get to revisit a past and correct it, or uh, at least um, explicate or address it. And there's a certain justice there that can happen through these narrative actions. Um, and it's also really interesting for audience criticality because you're able to address that moment from the present day, but also from within the past. And I find sound or audio is an excellent material for this bit figure because as Street says, sound has the ability to place us imaginatively in another time while physically we remain in the present. Um, and that's exactly what the split figure is doing. 
I find it needs to be a generous public figure. And what I mean by that is that the split figure needs to be relatable, understandable, legible to the public, right? I was talking to people about my own specific experience as a gay man, but also as just me. And so to make that work as a public act of communication, the split figure needs to have access points for the public to be able to access my own subjectivity. So the case study, I'm gonna look seven, a scene of seven minutes from all that solid melts into air. And it's, it's a scene from when I returned from Belfast back to Longford, where I'm from in, in the Midlands of Ireland to my village of Valleyman. And I talk about, I'm kind of regressing into my teenage years and how that was a time of fear for me and a time of loneliness. And I, my, my aim in this scene was to, to evoke, create the, the, a scene in that teenage years where I would go into nature and, and I would get solace from nature and I would feel protected by nature. So it was to create through ambient sound that sense of calm and of protection and of empathy that I felt from nature, from trees, from animals. Um, and in this scene, I'm talking about it from the present day. So that's the split figure from the present day in, this was in Limerick, but then I go back into the past and I inhabit that scene um, in, uh, on stage as well. So I'm kind of flitting between both temporalities, um, using the sound to reconstruct and re-inhabit. Um, and then I talk about, uh, I'll get down to the split figure here. So the elements that you'll hear here is the live spoken word, the vocally charged ambient sound, so there's the bog sound of me walking through a bog forest. There's my breathing that's in the soundtrack and on the stage live, and there's humming that's in the soundtrack. And that split figure, uh, once it's been established, the narration, um, once I've established the scene as a narration in the present day, I can then inhabit the past. Okay, now I'm gonna go, we're kind of running on with time. So I'm gonna play out this right, seven yeah. minutes and I'll just leave this slide up here for you guys. Um, just focus on the element and I suppose focus on what the sound is doing and then I'll come back and conclude afterwards. So here we go, seven minutes. But I think any sort of gay guy growing up in rural Ireland, like the shit really hits the fan when you hit puberty because it starts to get really real and you're like, okay, my biology is dictating where I go, whereas until then I felt my imagination was sort of able, I was able to sort of steer my ship with my imagination and all of a sudden that was getting hijacked by my changing body, fantasies, realizations, actual crushes, that kind of stuff. Um, so it was no, I used to sort of make little like clay figurines at the back of my I had sat the kitchen window, like in the clay outside the kitchen window and sort of like, play, like pretend there were people and that was like close to home. But by the time I was a teenager, there was basically a fear factor really came through really clear. I could like taste it in my throat, which was like the fear of change and like this a biological imperative where I felt I was being pushed in a direction that society was hostile to at that time, at least. And in many places still is. And it was against my wishes because I just wanted to fit in. And I wanted to have a normal sort of life, but fear of the ge general hostility and the homophobia that was around me, a uh, fear of being found out, you know? So that would, became a dominant, I think, tone in my life. And, and, and to deal with that, I started to kind of go into nature more and seeking refuge deeper into nature. So I really would, uh, I started going to the forest and to get to the forest near my house, there is um, a bog, so I'm walking through in my wellies um, the bog to get to the forest to go hang out in the forest. It's around twilight, like it's not nighttime yet. And I did, wasn't really conscious. I just go there because I like. I still do. I love nature, but it was somewhere where you can be at peace, and I could feel like I could. My imagination would come wilder because there's a lot of mythology about you know creatures in nature. My grandmother grew up in the West Coast and she was a fabulous storyteller and had great stories about like sea creatures and mermaids and things like that. And in the Midlands, we don't have that. We've got land and like river and lake based creatures. Bog, we've got the will of the wisp, which comes out of the bog. I got sort of impulsion to look for creatures or the presence of others that wouldn't, um, that would be benign. I 
I developed a real fondness for trees and I really felt that trees are really wise. I still feel that. And sometimes I'd go and just go really close to a tree because I felt I didn't really have the language to communicate what I felt or what I what I want, what I was feeling, and that in some way I could just sort of let it pass from me into the tree directly and, and something would come of that. intervene here the part is coming up now where um the the tree hug that you see in the photograph is about to start and that's kind of the the climax of the scene So that was my teenage years. <laughs> okay, so that's the clip. And of course, it's taken out of a context and there's a lot in there that you might not, you know, realize what it is, like the sounds of the sea and the, the, and the, the animals, the sea creatures towards the end is pitching forward to a whole other section that involves mythology. But um, I hope that was somehow instructive, you know, within the kind of limited time we have of some of the, the concepts I've been talking about. But I think so there, here's quickly the bibliography for uh, some of the, the theorists I've referenced today. And I will now hand over to the live section where you guys can ask, I have any questions or comments, I'd be, lovely to feel, I'd be happy to feel them. Thank you very much, guys.